As most of you obviously know, shortly after um, I did my programme yesterday, and around the time it was published, news came that President Biden had just announced that he was no longer seeking the candidacy of the Democratic Party in the election, the presidential election in November. Now, this has happened after weeks of continuous plotting and conspiracy and faction fighting within the Democratic Party, triggered by President Biden's disastrous performance in a television debate with Donald Trump. And for a short time, it looked as if the recent assassination attempt on Donald Trump would cause the demands for President Biden's for President Biden to step down to subside. And it did seem also that President Biden had the support of the um, Congressional Black Caucus, the Democratic Party's Congressional Black Caucus. But those uh, that brief stabilization proved to be extremely short um, within a few hours and days reports resumed that demands were growing within the Democratic Party for President Biden to step down. And as I discussed several programs ago, it was quite obvious to me that a plot was underway. The President Biden, as of Friday, had made no decision to step down and was clearly very unwilling to do so, even though the plotters, allegedly led by former President Barack Obama, were seeking an announcement that he would step down on Sunday. But I did also say that despite the fact that President Biden clearly did not want to step down, I thought it more likely than not that the pressure on him would be overwhelming and that by some point he would indeed announce that he was giving up his attempts to be elected president or re-elected president of the United States. And well, the plot, the conspiracy against him has succeeded and that we have what we are seeing is the result of a conspiracy and of a very grudging and reluctant decision by Biden himself is indicated by a number of rather interesting things. Firstly, the announcement when it came, came suddenly. Apparently, the White House staff were not informed in advance Somebody, in other words, took the decision that they were not going to be con- they would not be consulted, lest perhaps they persuade the old man to change his mind. So it was done when the decision was finally made. The announcement was rushed through very quickly. It did not take the form of a presidential address. Now this is really astonishing. The last time a president resigned shortly before an election was in 1968, when in March 1968, many months, in other words, before the presidential election, um, the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson, went on national television and said that he would be focusing on trying to get negotiations underway between the United States and North Vietnam, and that this would be taking up all of his attention, and in light of that, he would not seek and would not accept the candidacy of his party for the um, presidency of the United States in the election in the fall. That came as a massive surprise, um, but it was also... Um, something that was announced to the American people in what one might expect um, to be, what one might feel was a proper way. There was a presidential address. There was no doubt that the president himself was um, fully confident about the decision and had made the decision, obviously after widespread discussion and consultation within his administration. But anyway, 
it was done, as I said, in a very different way from the way it's been done this time. This time, President Biden did not pull out in March, when there would still have been perhaps time to organise a um, primary campaign of some kind to pick a successor. He left it very late to the last uh, half, the second half of July, with the election itself just over 100 days away. And instead of announcing the decision in a address to the American people, a brief statement appeared in which the president said that for the good of the country and of his party, he was intending to stand down. He didn't actually give any real reason why he was taking this step. He didn't say that it was because he was ill or because he was unable to continue to remain in, to, to uh, um, discharge his presidential duties. Um, he just said, without any real explanation, that he would not seek to be a candidate in the election in November, something that he was insisting that he would be just a few hours before. And he also said, importantly, that he intends to remain president until January and that all will be explained in an address to the American people that will come at some point this week. We're not told when, as of the time of making this programme, I still don't know when this presidential address is actually going to take place. So a very brief, uninformative statement, not really explaining very much about this decision, other than informing us that the decision had in fact been made. And interestingly enough, that statement also did not announce any support from the president for any part, any other person who might be taking his place as a candidate in the election. So there was no endorsement of Kamala Harris, the vice president, who would be expected to take over from the president as the party's candidate, the Democratic Party's candidate in the election in November. And obviously, somebody noticed this fact and was concerned about it because then, very bizarrely and weirdly, a statement from the White House, or from, more to be more precise, from the campaign team, appeared on Twitter X, telling us that the president was going to back Kamala Harris, his vice president, for the nomination to be the candidate of the Democratic Party in the election for the presidency in November. It almost seemed as if this was an afterthought, and one got the distinct impression, at least I got the distinct impression, that this was something else that the president hadn't really wanted to do, and that he was basically pushed into doing it. So a very messy announcement altogether, and one which leaves everybody in a state of some uncertainty. And there continues to be uncertainty hanging over Kamala Harris, even though I would say that all the facts, all the, all the logic of the situation overwhelmingly points towards her becoming the Democratic Party's candidate in the election in November. So far, Barack Obama, the former president, who apparently the president himself, Joe Biden, believes was the arch plotter, he said absolutely nothing. He's given no word of endorsement of Kamala Harris. Neither has Nancy Pelosi, who is widely seen as another of the key plotters. Um, there's been some unwillingness on parts of the donors to speak out in support of Kamala Harris. At the moment, one gets a sense that there's no massive enthusiasm for Kamala Harris on the part of the very top tier of the hierarchy of the Democratic Party. Even though, I have to say, 
once the logic of the situation becomes clear and impresses itself on everybody, I expect all of these people eventually to swing into line. There have been various painstaking theories as to why people like Obama and Pelosi and the others have held back from endorsing Kamala Harris. And there's been an article in the um, British media, in the Daily Telegraph to be precise, which says that Biden himself has serious doubts about Harris and that this was one reason why he was very reluctant to stand down as president because he didn't believe and doesn't believe that Kamala Harris can actually defeat Donald Trump. Well, as I said, we've discussed some of these theories. Alex Christoforo and I on a program that we've just done on the Duran. We cover the resignation, the announcement of that Biden himself was standing down from the candidacy in a live stream yesterday. I, I think that all I am going to say, all I'm going to add to all of that in this program is simply this, that Kamala Harris is undoubtedly going to emerge as the candidate because there is really no one else who can fulfill that role. Trying to find another candidate would deepen the sense of crisis and chaos within the Democratic Party. And I don't think that this is something that its leaders want just 100 days before the election. But the fact that all of these complex games are being played, that the Clinton faction is apparently strongly backing Harris after they strongly backed Biden, that Obama is holding back, all of that, it tells us that there is little confidence in victory in November and little confidence that Kamala Harris is the person who is going to deliver that victory. Now, the most important fact about the events of yesterday is that though Biden has announced that he is no longer a candidate for the presidency, of the re-election to the presidency in November, he's also said that he intends to remain president until January when the new president, the one who is elected in November, is inaugurated. So the United States now finds itself in a situation where a president who has been rejected by his own party, the Democratic Party, whose credibility has been shattered with speculation and talk and rumours that he is physically and mentally incapable of conducting the campaign to be elected president, um, where this person, the president, um, is in effect a discredited figure with no authority within the political system. This person is apparently going to remain president right up until January. At least that is what he says. Now, this is an absolutely bizarre situation. I think it is completely unsustainable. Already there's been a string of Republicans who've come out and said that President Biden needs to start, step down. If he can't, if he can't, if he hasn't got the mental and physical ability to campaign for the presidency, then he obviously cannot be president him, president now. And statements to this effect have been made by Senator Marco Rubio, uh, Senator Josh Hawley, um, vice presidential nominee and Senator J.D. Vance, Speaker Mike Johnson, and also by independent figures like the legal scholar and lawyer, um, and, um, um, Jonathan Turley. And I think at some point, the logic of this is going to force itself both on Biden and on the Democratic Party. I think they will gradually come to understand that if Biden remains 
in the White House right up until January. Um, that is going to make Kamala Harris's job all but impossible. She's going to find that the main topic in the election going forward is why Biden has not resigned from the presidency, not why she should be elected president. So I think at some point they will turn around and try to get the old man to face reality and to step down. On the basis of his behaviour up to this point, he will probably resist. But anyway, we shall see how that plays out. In the meantime, most governments around the world, in fact, all governments around the world, are going to conclude that there is a vacuum of power in the United States, that the person who occupies the office of president not only lacks the capacity the physical and mental capacity to execute that office, but that he actually lacks the political authority to do so either. He has been rejected by his own party. The entire political class is united in agreeing that he should not be president and cannot be president, and yet he remains in place. And this inevitably is going to impact on the international prestige and authority of the United States in the weeks and months going forward. Another reason, I think, why at some point someone is going to have to decide on the Democratic side that the president must stand down, at which point, of course, Kamala Harris will become president, not in the way that she would have wanted, I suspect. But anyway, that, that's how it will be. And then at least she will be able to go into the election as the incumbent. I think the sooner this is sorted out for the Democratic Party, the better it will be. But given how completely they have mismanaged this whole affair up to this point, I'm not confident that they, for the moment fully understand this. Anyway, enough of all of the politics, the intrigues, the conspiracies and all the rest. Let me just make a few quick observations. Firstly, the fundamental key point. Joe Biden, in my opinion, was never really in a condition to become president of the United States. That was obvious to me during the 2020 election. We discussed it frequently in many programs on the Duran, um, Alex Christoforo and I. I made the parallel um, during the election itself. Indeed, at the time of the Democratic Party's convention in August 2020, when Biden was nominated candidate, that nominating Biden for the presidency was a little like what the Spanish did when they tied the corpse of El Cid, the Spanish warrior El Cid, and sent him galloping towards the enemy army into battle. There's a famous film starring Charlton Heston in which you can see that whole scene playing out. Anyway, that is what I said then. I have never thought that Joe Biden was remotely in a position to execute fully and properly the office of the President of the United States. What has happened in the three and a half years since then, four years in fact since then, if we're going back to August 2020, is that the American people have been treated to an elaborate fiction promoted by the Democratic Party, the administration, sections of the permanent bureaucracy, and most of the media, that the president was in full command and control of the US government, when quite obviously and plainly that was not the case. I would have thought that would be an important thing for American voters to bear in mind when the election takes place in November and should influence the way they vote. That is one thing. The second, and it follows closely on the first, is that perhaps because 
Joe Biden has been incapable of managing the affairs of the United States effectively. This has been the worst presidency, in my opinion, in my lifetime. Now, I say that there have been, in my view, a series of disastrous presidencies ever since the end of the Cold War. When George H.W. Bush lost Re his, re his, his attempted re-election in 1991 and stood down in 1992, the United States was looking at a massively strong geopolitical position. Its major adversary, the Soviet Union, had collapsed and imploded following a political crisis which, by the way, no one foresaw. Um, the um, potential rivals to the United States, countries like China and India, hardly measured up to American power. In 1990, in 1991, China's economy was only a small fraction the size of that of the United States. The US was dominant in the Middle East. It had the most powerful position in Europe. It was incredibly strong. It was truly a unipolar moment. Now, that was never likely to last for very long, but certainly the United States was in a unique position when Bill Clinton became president in 1992 to build on the strength of that position and to secure the long-term future of the United States, perhaps not as the world's dominant power, but certainly as the world's preeminent power, and to shape the political system, the global political system around itself. That opportunity has been squandered and thrown away by a succession of disastrous presidencies. The first of which was Bill Clinton's. Uh, George W. Bush then came in and made the situation much worse with a series of ill-conceived, disastrous, as well as illegal and immoral wars in the Middle East. And then Obama's presidency, which came in full of promise that things would at least be put right. Well, to a degree that I found at the time dismaying, it was basically continuity, Clinton and George W. Bush, making the situation even worse. The best that can be said for these three presidents, Clinton, George W. Bush and Obama, is that they did, however, understand the importance of maintaining at least civil relations with the leaders of the other great powers of Russia and China and India and the rest. And this was, of course, the period of summit meetings and discussions and whatever, even though it must also be said that nothing very much or very positive came out of those discussions. Then we had the chaotic interlude of Donald Trump's first term. I say first term because I believe more likely than not it, there will be a second. Donald Trump seemed to understand that the trajectory followed since 1992 had been appallingly wrong. He did at least show an understanding of the need for a return to diplomacy. He tried to improve relations with Russia. He tried to stabilize relations at a political level with China, even whilst recalibrating the economic relationship. <coughs> he reached out to North Korea and he avoided further wars in the Middle East. But, as is well known, Donald Trump, in his first term, was never master of his house. And besides, I was never really sure 
that he had a clear, coherent understanding of foreign policy or of the trade-offs that needed to be made or of the importance of establishing a consistent and clear framework for engagement with other countries without which his foreign policy could not succeed. So anyway, Trump came and left, and then we got Joe Biden. And Joe Biden has taken the disastrous leg legacy of the Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama years, and made it far, far worse. Uh, under him, the United States has sought confrontation, basically throughout the world. It's found itself in a proxy war against Russia in Ukraine, which it is losing. It is drifting into a confrontation with China in the Asia-Pacific region, where it has no realistic prospect of success. And it has been presiding over an utterly chaotic and disastrous situation in the Middle East, where US authority and prestige and support is collapsed. And to compound all of the problems, Biden himself has failed, even in that one thing, that one part of understanding that um, his pre predecessors, Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama at least retained, as I said, all of them understood the importance of maintaining civil relations with the leaders of the other great powers. Joe Biden has shown no ability even to do that. He has abused the leaders of Russia and China. He has repeatedly referred to Xi Jinping as a dictator. His comments about Putin are of a kind that I would never once have expected a president of the United States to make. The result is a fraught and disastrous international situation where many people now are talking about the prospect of World War III and are worrying that World War III might in fact be just round the corner. And alongside all of that, the authority prestige of the United States has collapsed. There are now moves, concerted moves, by a large number of powerful countries to move outside the financial and trading system dominated by the dollar, created by the United States in the 1940s, which, by the way, in the <laughs> um, Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama era, was unchallenged. Well, now there is a serious intention, not only to challenge it, but to create something completely different and outside the control of the United States alongside it. And we've seen the United States also experience not just a massive decline in its influence, but a massive decline in its relative power relative to other countries. And to just get a sense of how bad the situation has become, just go to the comments of General Christopher Cavalli, the um, NATO, uh, the military commander of NATO in Europe. NATO, <coughs> Europe being, of course, the continent where the United States won its um, Cold War victory, the one which gave the United States that incredible freedom of action, which has now been squandered. 
Well, Cavalier is now coming out and saying things like this. We can't be under any illusions. At the end of a conflict in Ukraine, however it concludes, we're going to have a very big Russia problem. We're going to have a situation where Russia is reconstituting its force, is located on the borders of NATO, is led by largely the same people as it is right now, is convinced that we're the adversary, and is very, very angry. Now, Cavalier says a lot of other things. He still incredibly talks about the possibility of Ukraine winning the war, something which I don't believe that he himself believes. But that paragraph tells us everything. Instead of securing victory, the victory that the West, the United States, achieved in the Cold War, well, it's all been thrown away. Now, I ought to say <laughs> quickly that I think that there never was a victory in the Cold War. I think that the United States misjudged what happened at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s. They failed to understand that the, that the Russian leadership and indeed Russian society had made a positive decision to seek peace. And it was this, in my opinion, which led to the disastrous miscalculations of the Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama era. But there is no doubt at all that Joe Biden and his team have massively compounded those mistakes and brought us to a position now when the situation in Europe is in crisis and everything everywhere else is going from bad to worse as well. Now, I am also going to say that in my opinion, the Biden administration, when the history books are written, is going to prove to have been at least as disastrous in its mismanagement of the US economy, that the growth that the United States has experienced over the last few years, which Joe Biden, in his statement of yesterday, announcing that he was no longer a candidate, bizarrely said <laughs> was an achievement as great as the one that had been achieved in the 1930s when the United States overcame the Great Depression. I, I really found that comment so weird, I'm not going to discuss it. Anyway, my own view is when the history is written, it will be seen that the economic legacy of the Biden administration is every bit as disastrous as its foreign policy legacy. But I don't propose to discuss that in this program. To repeat again, most of this is a product of the president's inability to conduct the affairs of the United States effectively. He was never the sort of person that I would have wanted to see president as president. He has always been, in my opinion, viscerally a neocon. But had he been fully on top of his, of his uh, abilities, I suspect that he would nonetheless have avoided some of the blunders and pitfalls and mistakes that he has made, just as George W. Bush, for example, did when he was president. And he, of course, was also a neocon. As it is, because the president has been so weak, he has been manipulated by his advisers, all of whom, each of whom, has had their own perspective on affairs, but none of whom has been able to bring to those affairs the holistic understanding that the president, as the commander-in-chief, would inevitably have. So, there we are, an utterly disastrous presidency, an appalling political legacy left to the United States. I don't know how the situation is going to resolve itself. If 
The Trump Vance team is indeed elected in November and takes over in January. They really are going to have a mess to contend with. And <coughs> it's far from clear to me how they'll be able to sort it out. If, God help us, it's Kamala Harris, I suspect that the present problems are going to simply go on getting worse. But anyway, one way or the other, an undignified, sordid, shabby end to a catastrophic presidency, one which has weakened the United States, dismayed its true friends, brought chaos and war to the world, and one which, tragically and alarmingly, with Joe Biden still in the White House, is not yet over. Anyway, there we are. Let's move on and let's go to that perennial topic of these programmes, which is the conflict in Ukraine, because this is the conflict which drives the news. Now, I mentioned General Cavalli and his various statements. It's quite clear to me that General Cavalli um, understands much of what other people don't. After all, he is a military officer and the NATO commander, and he has overall uh, supervision, apparently, of the way in which the war in Ukraine is being conducted. Anyway, I think that he fully understands that the war in Ukraine is being lost. He's quoted as saying this, that in modern warfare, a military force either wins fast and up front or is stuck for a long slog full of unpredictable twists and turns, which is clearly the course of the Ukraine conflict. A lot of it's going a lot of it's going to come down to force generation capability. Which side can generate force fastest and take advantage of that whilst they have a window of opportunity? By most accounts, Russia is doing this and has by far the advantage in terms of manpower and artillery shells. He then says that he's still optimistic about Ukraine's chances, but then he goes on to say, we can't be under any illusions. Now, I don't think he really believes much of this optimistic spin about Ukraine. After all, he knows perfectly well that if he, as the overall general and over American general, overall supervising the Ukraine conflict, were to come along and say that all in Ukraine is lost and the country is crashing to defeat, well, that might even that might have such an effect that it might even trigger a collapse in Ukraine itself. So he still has to pretend that the situation can be turned round in some way. But he must know that most wars are not won fast and up front. And by the way, those which are don't generally end well for the party that thinks it has won them. Think Afghanistan, Iraq, and others. Most wars are fought over a long slog full of unpredictable twists and turns. And as he says, it's the Russians who have the advantage and who are winning. But anyway, put that aside, let's actually go to the situation on the battlefronts. And, um, Again, over the last 24 hours, more reports of more Ukrainian repeat, retreats and of an accelerating um, collapse by, of Ukrainian resistance in Donbass. Let's start with Krasnogorovka, this town that has been um, basically besieged by the Russians since March. They've long since captured the greater part of Krasnogorovka. They've taken their time to complete their uh, occupation of the town. Yesterday, I quoted a Russian official who basically suggested that the 
delay in clearing the town was connected to the presence of large numbers of civilians in it. But this morning, there are reports, this time from the Ukrainians themselves, and they are public reports this time, that the Ukrainians only control um, a number of buildings in the northwest of Krasnogorovka, and that they're being pushed out of the town, and that it is expected now that the main metropolitan area of Krasnogorovka is about to fall fully under Russian control. The Russians apparently capturing five buildings in this area at a time, and one gets the sense that there's been only light resistance by the Ukrainians, and that they are in fact retreating. <coughs> now, it's been suggested that the Ukrainians have in fact made a decision, finally, to pull out of Krasnogorovka, and that they're trying to create defence lines a little further to the west. And I should say that a fact which I had not fully understood, I'm not a good person at reading maps, is that there is a spur of Krasnogorovka uh, from the main metropolitan area. There's a spur at the northwest that directs along a road for some distance, stretches along a road for some distance, and that it is this area that the Ukrainians apparently are seeking to defend. And it's not difficult why they would, might want to do that, because beyond this area of Krasnogorovka, you arrive at a place called Alexandropil, another village, and then beyond that village, on the other side of the reservoir, there is Kurakovo itself, one of the most... Uh, Kurakovka, Kurakov, Kurakivka, sorry, it's a village, but... Well, a lot nearby, um, as I said, there's another reservoir, and then, as I said, you get to Karakovo itself. And the Russians, of course, are already very close to Karakovo. They appear to have captured the village of Georgievka, which is um, just west, uh, or just east of Karakovo. And they're already fighting in a village called Maximilianovka, which is located immediately to the west of Kurakovo. So the Ukrainians need to control this stretch of road, this final spur of Krasnogorovka, to prevent, to stop a Russian advance on Kurakovo um, from Krasnogorovka itself. Well, I think the battle for Gorakovo is probably going to start in the next two or three weeks. Um, Ukrainian sources themselves are now saying that we're in the last week of Ukrainian control of the main part of Krasnogorovka. The very fact that the Russians have now reached so close to Gorakovo itself is for Ukraine a crisis. And elsewhere, further north, I discuss how the Russians have captured the village of Progress and Yevgenivka and Sokol, my guess, and Novoselivka Persia, just to the south. My guess is that the next area that the Russians are going to attack, the next village that they're going to attack in this area, is Vozvizhenka cutting the main road between Pakrovsk and Toretsk and Konstantinovka and Chasov Yar. So a mighty battle is gradually playing out. The Russians coming very close to Kurakovo and to Pakrovsk itself and cutting the main su supply lines to the two main concentrations of Ukrainian forces further east in Donbass, the, ones, the one in Toretsk and the other in um, Chasov Yar. 
Now, we've had news today from both of these places. First about Toretsk and the situation in Toretsk, once considered one of the most heavily fortified areas of the entire contact line. Anyway, it is now looking absolutely disastrous. Not only have the Ukrainians been unable to defend themselves in Toretsk successfully, but it looks as if the situation is deteriorating very, very rapidly, far more rapidly than anybody had realized. Now, yesterday, there were reports saying that two battalions of the Ukrainian army have become cut off, are in effect encircled somewhere in the Torets sector. I am not exactly sure where this has happened, but that might be a force of several hundred men even if one assumes, as I do, that these two battalions are um, extreme, are, are severely weakened. The Russians, having managed to capture the village of Shumi, which is at the very eastern edge of the Torets conurbation some weeks ago, have apparently now captured the village of Pivnichnye, which is um, very close to the central area of Toretsk itself. And they are also apparently advancing towards another village called Zaliznie. And they have perhaps also managed to capture a third village in this area called Piv Pivdenie. I'm sorry if I'm getting the names of all of these places wrong. So this is in the northern area of the eastern part of the Toretsk conurbation. But, well, it gets worse because it seems that the Russians have also made major advances in the village of, no of New York, which they, of course, which the Russians, of course, themselves call um, Nov Novgorod uh, Novgorodka. And, um, well, the fighting for New York um, has moved Again, also very rapidly, the Russians have captured a village called Yurivka, which is to the northwest of uh, New York. They seem to be advancing towards the village of Andr or Alexandropil, which is just west, or uh, just east rather, of the H20 highway. It looks as if uh, the Russians are preparing to attack that village also and um, thereby further cutting Ukrainian uh, supply routes and endangering the encirclement of the Ukrainian forces in Toretsk and New York. And there are suggestions that the Russian forces from um, Pivnichnye moving towards Zaliznye could link up with the advanced Russian positions in New York itself, with perhaps the greater part of New York now under Russian control. And if that happens, over and above the several hundred Ukrainian troops in those two battalions who are apparently already cut off in the Torets area, um, a bag, cauldron, call it what you like, uh, will be created in which a significantly larger group of Ukrainian soldiers, perhaps one or two thousand, might find themselves in, in effect encircled and cut off from all lines of retreat as well. Now, that's already a critical situation. And remember what I said, this was formally assumed to be one of the most heavily fortified positions that the Ukrainians had all along the contact line. The speed with which Ukrainian defences in this area have crumbled has been astonishing. And this has played out over a period of less than two months, just so. But anyway, to add to all of this, there are reports that these soldiers who are at risk of being cut off are resisting instructions to retreat from this bag 
And it's been suggested that they're doing so because they fear that if they did retreat, they would come under Russian artillery fire and many of them might be killed. And rather than take that risk, they prefer to remain where they are. And if they are cut off, to negotiate the terms of their surrender to the Russians. Now that happens, we are, I think, very close to looking at an end game because as I've said previously in previous programs, we will know that the situation in the war is being lost when entire Ukrainian units take it upon themselves to surrender in large numbers uh, rather than to go on fighting or accepting instructions from Kiev. So, a catastrophic situation apparently starting to develop in the Toretsk area. As I said, this has been an unexpected battle and an unexpectedly fast Russian advance. Much Western commentary about the war over the last few weeks which has sought to claim that the situation for Ukraine is not so bad, that in fact the Ukrainians do have good prospects, has focused on the um, slowing of the Russian advance in Kharkiv region. The fact that the Russians haven't captured Kharkiv city and are still fighting to capture Volchansk. We'll come to Volchansk and this actual situation there shortly. Westerners who deal in this sort of thing, I have noticed, avoid all discussion of the situation in Toretsk, despite the fact that it is turning out to be so critical. And from a Russian point of view, <laughs> I'm going to suggest that Toretsk, whose major fortified position built up around various coal mines and major urban and industrial areas um, well um, <laughs> from a Russian point of view I'm going to say that Toretsk is even more important in order to achieve victory in Donbass which is the crucial theatre of the war than the situation in Volchansk is if one indeed goes to a map, one can see very quickly how the fall of Toretsk opens the way to Konstantinovka, further north, a town of about 70,000 people, which would itself become very vulnerable to a Russian attack from the north once the Russians capture Chasov Yar. We will come to that shortly. And of course, if Konstantinovka falls, then the Russians are at the gates of Kramatorsk. There are other places that they would have to capture um, north of Konstantinovka, but sh suffice to say, um, Kramatorsk would not be that far, and the defence lines leading up to it do not look so strong. <coughs> so this is an absolutely crucial battlefront, we were told that it was very heavily fortified by the Ukrainians. The Russians avoided attacking in this area throughout the period of the special military operation. And since they have started their offensive in this area, they've clawed their way through Toretsk at bewildering speed, much faster than I think even the most pessimistic Ukrainian planners could have imagined. And as I said, if Torres does come fully under Russian control, if this entire fortified position that the Ukrainians have created in this area collapses, then one can definitely talk about an operational crisis of extreme severity, as bad as the one that Ukraine is now experiencing in the Pakrovsk direction, where the Russians are 
now within 20 kilometers of Pakrovsk. So, a major crisis in the Toretsk area. Now, I mentioned Chasovya. We've had more news from Chasovya. It does look as if the Russians are doing exactly what Dima suggested. <coughs> they are probably well positioned now, or at least they probably still retain their bridgehead deep inside central Chasovya, west or uh, east west of the aqueduct. But they are also apparently advancing along the um, eastern bank of the aqueduct. They've captured Kalinina and they are indeed moving towards the village of Grigoryevka. There are some reports even that they've reached Grigoryevka and I well read one report which I suspect is premature that they've actually captured Grigoryevka. And as Dima at the military summary channel correctly said um, um, some time ago, a little time back, <coughs> if the Russians do succeed in capturing Grigoryevka and then continue to advance along <coughs> the east bank of the aqueduct and go on to capture places like Minkovka and other places, then they are within artillery range from the south of both um, Kram, uh, Slavyansk, further north, and of course also Kramatorsk as well. So, further Russian advances in Chasovya, and again the Russians looking unstoppable in this area. And lastly, in terms of the actual, the main line of contact, <coughs> further reports that the Russians <coughs> are advancing in the Kupiansk area <coughs> towards the Oskol River. I mentioned that they'd captured um, a village called Pishanye um, some days ago. Um, they have also apparently occupied all of the village of Makhevka on the east bank of the Zherebets River further south and appear to have crossed the Zherebets River into the other part of Makhevka on the west bank, the Ukrainian controlled west bank. But it looks like further north they're advancing towards the Oskol River. There are reports that Russian reconnaissance groups, teams, have already reached some of the Ukrainian-held villages on the east bank of the Oskol River. Um, something which, if confirmed, would suggest yet another operational crisis for the Ukrainians trying to hold the Russians bank, back from occupying Kupiansk and crossing the Oskol River and moving further towards occupying more territory in Kharkov region, placing them in a position where they can attack Slavyansk from the north. Lastly, let me now move on to Volchansk. Um, it's clear that the battle in Lipsy, where the Ukrainians were making counterattacks, has basically exhausted itself. The Ukrainian attempts to try to capture the, recapture the village of Gluborka, for the moment at least, seem to have failed. And I get the sense that the Ukrainians have stopped making these attempts. Well, the Russians continue to press forward within Volchansk itself. As I mentioned in one of my recent programs, General Apti Alodinov, Chechen Special Forces commander serving with the Russians said that the Russians have now captured a significant part of the citadel area, the high-rise buildings in northern Volchansk, where I suspect the men of the 71st Jaeger Brigade are largely cut off. Anyway, there is still clearly a lot of fighting going on in Volchansk, and the Russians have established a stable bridge bridgehead south 
of the Vulture River. But if one tracks the statements of Army Group North, their forces seem to be pushing more now from this bridgehead that they've established a little further west on the east bank of the Seversky Donetsk River. Now, it's not even clear exactly where this bridgehead is, but a group of forces north have been s suggesting that this bridgehead is being steadily expanded. And one view is that the Russians are beginning some kind of um, envelopment operation, looking to cut off Ukrainian supply routes to Volchansk from position uh, uh, by attacking from this bridgehead Ukrainian positions further south. Anyway, it's a complicated and very difficult battle. It's not clear at all to me what is going on exactly, except that I think that most people who are following the events in Volchansk still uh, most emphatically do get the sense that it is the Russians who continue to hold the initiative there. There's been few reports, or in fact no reports at all, about anything going on in Sumy region. It may be that all sorts of things are going on there, that there's intense fighting, uh, that the Russians might even, for all I know, occupy various border villages, but there's been no reports about this, either from the Ukrainians or from the Russians. And one must assume on that basis that the situation in Sumy region continues for the moment to remain quiet. Now, the aggregate story of all of this, and I, I understand that it's sometimes easy to lose the wood for the trees, to focus very much on what's going on in various indiv individual battles. But the overall picture is of a collapse, a slow motion collapse of Ukrainian resistance in Donbass. Um, in my previous programs, I've discussed how the Russians have cut the main road um, connecting the southern fortified town of Vuglidar to the main supply village, which is Konstantinovka. I've also discussed that there are reports that the Russians have crossed that road and are moving to cut, up, cut Vuglidar from its other remaining supply road. There are reports that the Russians are also, as we have seen, clearing Krasnogorovka, approaching Kurakovo, one of the major supply towns, that they're approaching Selidovo from other villages like Novoselivka, Persia, and Sokol that they've captured, that they're about to reach Akrovsk. They've captured, most reports say they've captured Progress, the village of Progress. They're likely to be capturing Vozvizhenka very soon. They are hammering the Ukrainians in uh, Toretsk, in the Toretsk area. The Ukrainian defense positions there seem to be disintegrating much faster than anybody could have expected. And they're also most likely on the brink of a major advance on Chasafyar, which will break Ukrainian resistance there as well. And all of this putting the Russians in a position where at some point over the next few months, they will be able to start the last part of the operation to clear the remaining part of Donbass, of Pakrovsk, of uh, Slavyansk, of Kramatorsk, bringing the whole of Donbass under Russian control. Now, I made this point before and I want to make this again. There is no analogous area to Donbass anywhere else in Ukraine. In no other part of Ukraine do you have the same complex web of small towns and um, industrial um, 
units, factories and railway lines and um, small rivers, all of which forming natural barriers which work to the advantage of the defender. In no other area of Ukraine do you have the coal mines, which are natural fortresses which can be adapted into exceptionally difficult to capture uh, fortified positions. And it seems also that the soil conditions and the weather conditions in Donbass make the area unsuitable for use by track vehicles, by tanks. So it's a very difficult place to capture. It's also the most heavily industrialized region of Ukraine, accounting for a large part of its industrial base. And it is the central key region, I would argue, in eastern Ukraine, in Ukraine east of the Dnieper River. The Russians are able to capture Donbass, then it becomes much more straightforward for them to occupy other places east of the Dnieper. The town, the city of Zaporozhye, begins at that point to look extremely vulnerable, for example. Uh, with Kura, with uh, Vuglidar lost, as I've said previously, it's inconceivable that Ukraine could conduct another offensive towards the Black Sea or the Sea of Azov, such as it attempted last year. And in fact, the Russians would quickly have the initiative in Zaporozhye and Kherson regions. And it's likely, I would have thought it was a certainty that Zaporozhye itself would become a target. Zaporozhye is a big city, about a million people, heavily built up. There are many factories there. It could, in theory, be defended for a long time. But deprived of its hinterland, deprived of the villages and small towns that surround all of these cities, it might not be as easy to defend as some think. The same probably true of other places. Kharkiv itself, for example. Um, it's worth pointing out that when the Russians did enter to large urban conurbations, Mariupol in southern Donetsk and Severodonetsk Lysychansk, um, in northern Lugansk <laughs> regions in the spring and summer of 2022, they were able to capture both places at relatively high speed. The Ukrainians found that the very size of these places actually made it more difficult to defend them than otherwise. There were many claims about heavy Russian losses in the capture of these of these cities. But of course, the Russians weren't as experienced in urban combat as they are now. They don't have the they didn't have the enormous drone fleets and the um, artillery and all the other mechanisms and the training and the experience and the skill in fighting in urban environments that they did at that time in 2022. So it might not be quite as complicated to capture these cities as some people imagine. And of course, there is the further question of whether the Ukrainian army itself would be as able to defend these places as it was in 2022. For the record, I suspect that once the Battle of Donbass is won, we will start to see the whole trend in the war accelerate rapidly. And indeed, that has been my view, my feeling about this war from the outset, that the key battle 
the battle that will decide the war is the one which has been fought in Donbass. And in that battle, the Russians are now within sight of victory. Moreover, if the Russians do capture Donbass, there is no practical way in which the Ukrainians can realistically hope ever to take it back. So, there we are. That, I think, is the reality of the war as of now. I think it is a reality that General Carvoli actually understands. I'm not sure that many others in the West do. But at some point, probably within the next few months, it's going to start impinging on the consciousness of more and more people. Anyway, that's that's my own view. Now, I should say that I have received, over the last 24 hours, a very interesting email from um, a source, somebody who has significant information from the Russian side, uh, but who is not, by the way, Russian. But anyway, um, this person has informed me of various things. Firstly, that there is a raging debate underway within the political leadership in Russia about what to do in the event of peace negotiations with any territory in Kharkov region in particular, which the Russians capture. Whether the Russians should be prepared to trade that in return for other concessions as part of negotiations, or whether it makes more logical sense if the Russians capture this territory to remain in this territory and to annex it to Russia itself. This is an inevitable debate, and we're going to get many more of them as the Russians continue to advance and to gain control of more and more territory. I suspect that in most of Kharkov region, this being an area that is overwhelmingly Russian-speaking and which belonged to what one might call historic Russia, I suspect that most of the people would not be at all averse, in fact would be favourable to this region or to the area of this region where they live being annexed to Russia. So it's important to remember that the more territory the Russians capture, the more territory Ukraine is likely to lose. Because, to be frank, if the people in Kharkiv region want the Russians to stay, I think it is going to be politically very difficult for the Russians to hand it back. Just saying. Anyway, that's one thing this source said. The other source made it very clear that the source, the source himself, and I suspect many people in Moscow, simply do not believe the production numbers about Western weapons that I've discussed recently and which have appeared in places like Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, Reuters and other places about production by the West of artillery shells and Patriot missiles. The Russians certainly, and this source also, believe that there is a major disinformation or misinformation exercise underway, and they believe that the true numbers in terms of production of shells and Patriot missiles is much higher than these articles suggest. Now, I, of course, do not know definitely what the truth is. How can I? I don't visit the factories. I don't speak to the um, I don't speak to the managers of the factories. I just have direct contact with the journalists who have written these articles. My sense is that these articles are probably true, that the situation is every bit as bad as the articles say. I accept that in saying this, I may be engaging in confirmation bias because this 
corresponds with my own understanding of the situation. I'm treating articles which appear to confirm it as true and discounting other articles and other claims which tell a different story. Without myself having access to the actual data, the actual information, I can't be sure, however, one way or the other. But, you know, each of us is entitled to go with our instinct. And I, my instinct tells me that these articles are telling the truth. Having said that, I accept that there is a different perspective, and I do believe that the Russians themselves certainly cannot quite believe that the munition and production numbers in the West are quite as bad as these articles say. And very much as this source is saying, that is causing the Russians to act even more aggressively on the battlefronts. They continue to believe or continue to fear that a major confrontation with the West is at least possible, and that is making them even more relentless and implacable in continuing their offensive. This is a fact which needs to be understood <coughs> and borne in mind, and it means, in my opinion, that there is going to be enormous resistance within Russia to any political figure who comes forward and says that Russia should slow down its offensive, even if that political figure is President Putin himself. Now, since we are talking about production issues, I'm going to also touch briefly, and as a final point in this program, to that article in The Economist about... Um, the fact that the Russians are only apparently able to make 100 artillery barrels a year because they have only one forge, one Austrian forge that can do this and that the Russians have almost um, exhausted their stockpile of Soviet-era tanks and armoured vehicles which they're refurbishing and pressing back into the battle. Now, when I read that, I, I've already commented on this article and I've said that, in my opinion, this is all fantasy stuff and that it seemed to me that there was a dearth of serious analysis and information behind it. But when I read this article, there was something about it that felt somehow particularly familiar. And then I noticed that one of the figures that is repeatedly quoted or cited in this article by The Economist, is of a gentleman called Mr. Pavel Luzin. Now, Mr. Luzin, I remember as a fellow of the Jamestown Institute, which is a well-known, very well-known neocon think tank. And I remember that he was the main inspirer behind a series of articles published by the Jamestown Institute some years ago, which I comprehensively debunked on a programme for this channel, in which the Jamestown Institute was saying that the Russians would not be able to increase artillery shell production to any significant degree. Well... I think that events have proved otherwise, that the optimistic predictions by the Jamestown Institute, as I said, partly inspired by Mr. Luzin, that the Russians would not be able to increase artillery shell production, have proved to be wrong. And I think most people today, even supporters of the Ukraine war, grudgingly acknowledge that fact. Of course, 
The fact that Mr. Luzin might have been completely wrong about shell production doesn't necessarily mean that he's also wrong about artillery, uh, uh, artillery barrels and um, tanks and such things. But for the record, I think that he is. I think he's one of these people who, again, is engaging in confirmation bias, the sort of thing I try to guard against when I do it in myself. I only wish that Mr. Lucin would be more um, honest with himself about that fact and a little bit more skeptical of some of the information he is working with. Anyway, there we are. That's my view about the situation. The Hopefully, the beginning of the end of a catastrophic presidency of the United States, but one which alarmingly is still not over, despite the announcement by Joe Biden that he wants to remain a candidate. I don't understand as I say, how he can continue to be a candidate and rem uh, how he can cease to be a candidate and remain president. And I hope the logic of the contradictions in this position become clear and that they become clear quickly. But one way or the other, I think that this has been a catastrophic presidency, the worst American presidency in my lifetime by a very wide distance. And the sooner it is over, the better for the United States and for the world. And a military situation in Ukraine, which is not only lost from the perspective of the United States and Ukraine, but which, in my opinion, is now lost irretrievably. Note that the F-16s have still not appeared, despite the fact that we were told they would be delivered in July. There's the latest word is that the pilots are still training and that they're not expected to finish their training now before the end of the summer. So it looks as if the F-16s might not be participating in the battle for several more weeks. Though, again, to make it clear, I don't think they will make any significant difference when they are eventually committed. But anyway, there we are. A terrible situation in Ukraine. A collapsing presidency in the United States. I said in my program yesterday that it is urgent now for the Europeans to reopen channels of communication to Moscow. I was skeptical that they would do so. I remain skeptical still. But we, as we see, the situation is becoming more urgent by the day and by the hour. And the longer time is wasted, the more irretrievable the situation will be. Well, that is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. We'll, we'll see what the twists and turns of the melodrama, the political melodrama in the United States are, is going to be. I remain firmly of the view that we can look forward, bar something unexpected, to President Trump in November and January. Um, and in the meantime, we can also expect further defeat and disaster in Ukraine. But this is where I end my program today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and subscribe star links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can find all sorts of amazing things, amazing t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, hoodies, all those great things, magic mugs. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button, check your subscription to this channel. That's me today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.